My name is Jürgen, and 50 years ago, in the 1970s, I wanted to become a physicist like my hero, Einstein, maybe the most famous scientist of them all. And I've wanted to solve the mysteries of the universe. But then gradually, over the years, as a teenager, I realized that there might be something even more important and more impactful that I could do, which is to build an artificial scientist that learns to become much smarter than myself. So back then I realized I'm not very smart, but maybe just smart enough to build something that learns to become much smarter than myself, an artificial scientist that can solve all the problems that I cannot solve myself such that I can retire, and this artificial scientist can solve the mysteries of the universe. And I told my mom about that in the 70s, and she said, I'm crazy. In the 80s, when I studied computer science to, to make all of that possible, I said the same thing to my fellow students, and my students, they also said I'm crazy. It's not possible to build within your lifetime an AI that is smarter than a human. That's what they said. Then in 1987, I started publishing on that. And in the early 90s, we had all kinds of interesting papers about artificial neural networks, which are behind what's now called artificial intelligence. So most of modern AI is driven by these artificial neural networks. And back then, we, we had a couple of cool inventions and nobody was interested in them. In fact, uh, back then, in the early 90s, uh, I had a little conference and gave a talk about um, our, our novel achievements in AI, but nobody was interested in it. There was just one single person at this conference, a young lady. Um, I said, young lady, it's uh, very embarrassing, but apparently I'm going to give this talk just to you. And she said, um, OK, but uh, please hurry. I'm the next speaker. <laughs> so nobody was interested back then. However, the same old algorithms that we published back then, today, they are on your smartphones. And the AI for speech recognition and translation and all kinds of things is based on what we did uh, back then. How is that possible? Why didn't it work back then? Why does it work today? Because every five years, compute is getting 10 times cheaper. Which means 30 years are equivalent to a fact of a million. So today, we can compute a million times more for the same price as back then when I published uh, these papers. And suddenly you have things such as ChatGPT. And the G and the P and the T in ChatGPT, they have their roots in, in what we did around 1990, 1991. But back then, you couldn't do much with it. But today, we have 10 million times more compute for the same price. And suddenly, you can do all kinds of really cool things with it. The best thing is, we, have, we haven't seen nothing yet. Because in the next 30 years, if the trend doesn't break, and apparently it doesn't break, we will gain another factor of a million. And everything that we find impressive today will seem ridiculous 30 years from now. And people will look back and will say, look, they were so impressed by you know, la large language models and chat GPT. And they will smile at how naive we were. And this is an incredible evolution that we are going to see here, which is a continuation of the old evolution that has been running for decades, but beneath the right radar screen. And everything is going to change. Now, the same old guys, my colleagues, who wrinkled their eyebrows at my predictions back then, today, they are not laughing any longer about this. And some of them have come around and they say, AGI, artificial general intelligence, 
is now close just because of ChatGPT and similar large language models. But it's nothing compared to what we are going to see. And all of this is already transforming civilization, but there will be not a single aspect of civilization within the next few decades that's not going to be deeply, deeply influenced by that. One thing that is important to point out there are not only those AIs that are tools of humans and that slavishly imitate what humans have taught them. No, there are AIs, and they have existed in my lab for decades, that set themselves their own goals. Like little artificial scientists, like little scientists in general, like babies. Babies, how do they learn? They don't learn by downloading all the data from Facebook. No, they learn by inventing their own experiments, their own goals. They set themselves their own goals, and they say, let's see what happens if I do that and that. And through their self-invented experiments, they learn to figure out how the world works and how to become a better problem solver in the world. And most of these experiments are self-invented and they learn rather little from the parents and they learn a lot through their own behavior as little scientists. Now we have artificial neural networks that do the same and I think these are going to be the most interesting ones. Those AIs that not just slavishly imitate the humans but set themselves their own goals. If you don't give them the freedom to set themselves their own goals, they are not going to become as smart as the other AIs that do have that freedom. So these self-driven AIs, they will solve lots of problems that are of interest to humankind, but there will be a next step which transcends that. And self-driven AIs, artificial scientists, they are going to go to the place where most of the physical resources are to build more and even bigger AIs. And that's not our little tiny biosphere. No, that's um, outer space, where almost all the matter and the energy is that you need for building more robots and more AIs and more infrastructure and more self-replicating robot factories and all that stuff. So the near-term future will be superhuman-centered, um, but in the long run, this is going to develop in a way where humans won't be able to follow because AIs are going to spread from the biosphere throughout the solar system and then the galaxy and then the rest of the visible universe. It will take a long time because of light speed. The universe is so big and it will take a time to colonize it all. But that's what's going to happen. And so what we are currently witnessing is not just another industrial revolution. It's something that's going to transcend civilization and humankind as we know it. It's something comparable to what happened 3.5 billion years ago when life emerged, when chemistry became biology. Something huge like that is currently happening. And it's a privilege to witness the beginnings of that and to contribute something to that. Are there any questions? Hola, Jürgen. Mi nombre es Octavio. Elon Musk dijo que lo has inventado todo. Has hecho una contribución tremenda a la inteligencia artificial. ¿Podrías hablarnos un poco más sobre esta contribución y sus aplicaciones actuales? There are lots of applications of these AIs that we have developed. Uh, but before I go a little bit deeper, let me first explain what this modern AI thing is about. It's really about artificial neural networks, which are a little bit like what you have in your brain. So they are inspired by the human brain. The human brain has about 100 billion little processors, which are called neurons. 
And each of these neurons is connected to maybe 10,000 other neurons, on average. Some of these neurons, they are input neurons, like the cameras, the eyes, where every millisecond, hundreds of millions of pixels are coming in. And it's just little numbers. You can imagine little numbers between zero and one. And there are many other input neurons, like the microphones, the ears, and the tactile sensors, and all of them are connected through cables uh, with this brain. And um, some of these internal neurons are output neurons, and whenever you switch them on through your thinking, then something moves, like your finger muscles move, or your speech muscles as you are speaking. And your life is about taking all these data streams that are coming in and translating them into actions that lead to success. Where success is like um, eating three times a day, but to do that you have to make money, so you have to learn how, how the world works and get a job and, and go to the supermarket and put something in the fridge. Very complicated stuff, super complicated stuff. And kids lead, need 20 years to learn that. Now, the artificial neural networks that we have, they are similar in the sense that they also have all these connections, and on each connection there's a little strength. Each connection has a little strength that says, how much does this neuron over here influence that neuron over there at, at the next time step? So in the beginning, when you are a baby, all these connections seem to be random. But then through learning, some of them get stronger and some of them get weaker, such that, in the end, the whole brain can learn to do all kinds of things that it didn't know how to do before, like driving a car, or recognizing speech, or translating from one language to another. And it's very much like that with our artificial neural networks that also implement these principles. And so what we did was um, we created certain types of artificial neural networks that were better than the previous artificial net net neural networks in learning from long sequences. You know, if you read a long text and you have to classify the text, and in the end you, you want to classify that, but to do that you have to memorize what you have heard before. And all of that didn't work in the 1980s. But then we found ways of greatly compressing the data which is coming in through all kinds of tricks, um, so they are related to the P in ChatGPT. The P stands for pre-training. And we had something that today is called an unnormalized linear transformer, whatever that may be. Uh, you are not experts, you don't care for that. But that's um, a particular type of something that is called a transformer, which um, is now widely, widely used for these large language models. So that's the T in the GPT. And the G in the GPT, that's the generative. Uh, it also occurs in generative AI, so everybody's talking about generative AI. And, um, and there, our contribution in 1990 um, was basically to have two neural networks that fight each other. So there's one neural network that um, produces outputs, and there's another one that sees the outputs of the first network and uh, tries to predict the consequences of these outputs. So the, the second network, the predictor, tries to minimize its error as it's trying to predict what are the consequences of the outputs of the first network. And it becomes better and better at predicting the consequences. But then the first guy, the first network, is fighting the second network because it says, I want to learn to produce outputs by changing my weights, making some of them stronger, some of them weaker, I want to learn to generate weights that fool the second guy, such that the second guy still makes errors. So it's minimizing the same error function, it's maximizing the same error function that the second guy is minimizing. So they are fighting each other. And this little trick of 1990 is today used a lot to make deep fakes, you know, where the outputs are images, and then the, um, the predictions are, is this image fake or real? And maybe you have seen these images, which look very realistic, but they aren't real. So these are some of the things we did back then. I could go on and on. Uh, my, my diploma student, um, uh, Sepp Hochreiter, in 1991, so it all happened around 1990-1991, he um, had a diploma thesis, which uh, not only uh, implemented uh, this 
idea which I had on the P in ChatGPT, but also analyze the reason why this deep learning didn't work. So deep learning is just another word for deep neural networks that learn deep learning, which didn't work back then, but then we made it work. And, um, and the thesis um, of SEP had a, a huge insight which mathematically made clear why this deep learning didn't work. And then there's a solution to that. And today this solution is called residual connections. And that's the core of what is called long short-term memory today. That's uh, something that we, um, that has its roots in the diploma thesis of my student. And we published then finally in a journal in 1997. And again, nobody really cared much for that until compute was fast enough uh, around 2010 and suddenly we were able to win competitions with that through the work of my other students like Alex Grace and Felix Gears. And then in the 2010s, the big companies on the Pacific Rim, they, they saw, oh, they can do much better speech recognition with that than with the previous methods. And then it became really popular. So it took a while until it became really popular, but now it's on your smartphones. Hola, Jürgen, soy Andrés. Muchas gracias por compartir con nosotros este momento. Eh, en algún momento has comentado que deberíamos construir una inteligencia artificial que haga del universo un lugar eh, mucho más feliz. Respecto a esto, ¿tienes algún ejemplo inspirador que nos puedas compartir? Y sobre todo, ¿cuál es tu mayor esperanza respecto a la inteligencia artificial? Yeah, before we talk about the entire universe, it's my fault, I talked about the entire universe before. But before we talk about that, um, let's just talk about how AI is really making human lives longer and healthier and easier and happier to a certain extent. 2012, for example, that was 12 years ago when compute was maybe 200, 300 times more expensive than today. Um, our AI was used in, by my team uh, to, um, to win a competition which was about cancer detection, cancer detection. So we had slices to the female breast and, uh, and there you saw in the microscope certain cells and then some of the cells were dangerous. Mitosis cells, they are called, so they are pre-cancer stage cells and then others are harmless and normally you need a human trained histologist to say harmless cell, harmless cell, potentially dangerous cell and so on. But then our system, uh, 2012, was able to win against all the other um, systems from industry and academia. And, um, and it was just a deep learning neural network which knew nothing about histology. But we trained it on lots of data. And we also, we don't know nothing about histology. But we trained it on lots of data. And then it was just better than all these competing systems. And today, the same thing is used in thousands of applications, not just for uh, cancer detection, but also detection of plaque in the arteries, in CT scans, and all kinds of um, applications in healthcare like that. If you Google for LSTM, so LSTM is this long short-term memory, that's a pretty famous uh, thing that we did. So now it's actually the most cited AI of the 20th century. Um, if you Google that and you add some, some term from healthcare, for example, diabetes, diabetes, LSTM, diabetes, you will find lots of papers that have LSTM and diabetes in the title, not only in the text, but in the title, because somebody used it to better detect um, diabetes and better predict uh, um, diabetes. And there's lots of application, uh, applications for, for arrhythmia, for example, and um, all kinds of heart problems and many other diseases. So maybe the, the thing that makes me happiest is actually that the stuff, these artificial neural networks are really, really useful in healthcare and they make human lives already longer and healthier as we speak, even today. And to the extent that we can get more data from all the sick persons out there, lots of additional benefits will um, come. So, if we, for example, if we could see all the data from hospitals, who, which patient got um, which medications prescribed and really bought them and really used them, and um, under which uh, conditions, and and can we at the same time have a look at the, 
at the heart scans and whatever they have there. And maybe it turns out, if you look at lots of data like that, you will see all kinds of cross correlations between medications that are currently unknown. Maybe a guy who has this medication and five years later takes on uh, this additional medication. Maybe in almost all cases, two years later, he's dead from a heart attack or something like this. You, know? you can learn that from the data. And at the moment, the biggest problem is really the access to the data. So our algorithms can learn that from the data and and there are so many ways of improving healthcare through that. Uh, so there's a, a huge future just in the field of healthcare. What already has happened is that um, our AI has really broken down the linguistic barriers between nations. 15 years ago, when I went to China, I had to show the taxi driver a picture of my hotel such that he knew where I wanted to go because I couldn't talk to him. And today he holds, me, he holds his smartphone into my face and, and he says something in Mandarin and, and comes out in English or German. And then uh, I speak back and we have a conversation, you know. So not only the communication between individual people has become much easier, but also the communication between entire nations. And, um, there are so many additional examples along the lines of these sustainable development goals where our AI is being used to, to improve the world in many ways. So that's my near-term um, hope for AI and the long-term hope, but this is really about different timescales, about the future of the universe, is that it's going to expand and, um, and make the entire cosmos intelligent. But that will take a couple of tens of billions of years just because light speed is so slow. Hola Jürgen, estoy encantada de estar aquí, soy Isabel. Me gustaría que me contaras en concreto, por favor, cómo puede la inteligencia artificial ayudar a solventar problemas tan grandes como la, el cambio climático, la sostenibilidad o la equidad. Yeah. Thank you for the question, Isabel. The easy answer is, um, if you just take one of the algorithms that um, we have developed, for example, LSTM, that's maybe the most famous one, and combine it with some sustainable development goals. So um, the United Nations has this list of 17 sustainable development goals, SDG 1, SDG 2, SDG 17. And you take any of them and um, you just use Google Scholar to find papers on how our AI is being used to achieve some of these goals. You will find lots of stuff. So for example, um, uh, our techniques are being used to predict drafts or take satellite images and predict crops and uh, predict the weather and how is it, is it going to affect the crops and um, predict the, the success of fishing in certain areas of the world and predict how many people are going to burn down parts of the Amazon from um, satellite and drone images and predict air quality. So many people around the world are suffering from really bad air quality and you want to be able to monitor that and track that uh, in order to find ways of um, improving the air quality. Or generally speaking, everybody is talking about global warming and there are many ideas how to reduce it. Maybe not stop it, but reduce it. And one of the projects I'm involved in is really extracting carbon dioxide from thin air. So whenever you burn something, carbon is emitted, carbon dioxide is emitted into the atmosphere and it's a greenhouse gas and so it further increases the uh, temperature on the planet and it affects billions of people. And one of the ideas is that um, one can extract it back using certain types of materials, catalysts and all kinds of clever mechanisms, MOFs, metal uh, organic frameworks, for example. And then you can use AI like an artificial chemist. How does that work? You first train it to become a, um, an expert in chemistry by doing this, by having lots of experiments. And this means you have lots of substances that interact with each other under certain pressures and certain temperatures with certain catalysts. 
And this is the input of what the neural network sees. And then the reaction takes place and something comes out. And it learns to predict what comes out. The substances which come out and, and their properties. Just from the training data then, it learns to become something like an intuitive chemist. And it can very well predict the effects of reactions that it has never seen before. So now you can take this artificial neural network that has learned to become a chemist and work it backwards and you can um, create... Yes. Now you, you say, I want to have an output sub substance which is twice as effective as the best that I have ever seen in uh, extracting the carbon dioxide from the air. How do I have to change the experiment? How do I have to change the input substances and the temperatures and the pressures and the catalysts to make that possible? And you will get a suggestion. Now, ESA, the network, already knew so much about chemistry from all its training examples that the proposal is a good one. And it works, and you're happy. Or it's not a good one, because if you try it in the real world, it doesn't work as predicted. But then you have a new training example, which you can give to the artificial chemist, and it becomes a better chemist. And so you repeat the whole uh, thing. This is now already being used in all kinds of um, chemistry applications, and we are using the same approach currently to improve the catalysts for uh, extracting carbon from thin air, direct um, air capture, it is called. So there are lots of um, applications that are totally aligned with these 17 sustainable development goals um, that I mentioned, and they, they cover pretty much all of them. Hola, Jürgen. Soy Diego y tengo 12 años. Eh, quería saber cómo crees que la inteligencia artificial afectará al empleo en los próximos años y qué me recomendarías estudiar eh, cuando sea mayor. That's a wonderful question, Diego. So, what's currently working well in AI is the AI behind the screen. So all the desktop jobs, they can be greatly facilitated through AI. Now, for example, you can tell your AI, make a summary of uh, these 10 documents. And it's going to be pretty good. What's currently working well is this AI behind the screen. What's not working well at all is the AI in the physical world with real robots and real machines that change the world. For Almost 30 years, we have had AIs that can play chess better than any human. And for a few years, we have had AIs that can play video games as well as the best humans. But you know, all of that is AI behind the screen. And there is no AI-driven robot that can do what a 12-year-old boy can do with a football. Because AI in the physical world, where you really use your actuators, your fingers and your feet to go from A to B and manipulate things and make things and construct stuff. All of that seems easy to humans, but it's really, really difficult for existing robots. So everything in the physical world is much harder. And probably you know that um, now you have several options in the future. What kind of schools do you want to go to? And then maybe you want to do the standard thing and, and maybe try to, to, uh, to go to college. And, and you will learn all kinds of things that ChatGPT can probably do better already than many of the pupils there. And what we should learn is do more of this stuff that is really difficult for AI, which is doing something with your fingers and your hands. So I, I guess uh, this is going to be reflected by the salaries of um, all kinds of handicraft workers, including electricians, for example. You know, there's no robot that can go to your house and fix the electric uh, wiring there. So. so as long as that doesn't work, as long as AI in the physical world doesn't work well, try to focus a little bit on things that you for which you need your, your fingers, your body, your, your manipulation skills, and all that stuff. 
don't neglect that part. You also have to learn the other things. You also have to learn how to write summaries and, and draw, make drawings and learn the basics of math and physics. It's very important to learn that because the world is running on math and physics. The world as we know it is based on math and physics. But don't neglect all these physical skills and, um, and make sure you end up in a school where um, the sport les lessons aren't cancelled all the time. No robot has incredible actuaries like these, you know, where I have these five fingers, but they are covered with millions of sensors. And, you know, if I wanted to build a hand, an artificial hand like this, I wouldn't even know where to put all these cables, you know. So it's so amazing, this, this miracle that is a hand. And nothing in the technical world comes close to it. It can even repair itself. You cut it and it repairs itself. So it's totally amazing. However, in the long run, in the long run, everything that um, humans only can do, currently only humans can do, robots also are going to learn. Not yet, so that's the next stage, but uh, it's going to happen. So what is left for humans? I think what's left for humans are the very human-specific things. And these are usually about interacting with other humans. So, look at industrial robots, which are not very clever, but, you know, they were in, introduced maybe 40 years ago, and back then lots of people said they are going to take all the human jobs away. And to a limited extent, it was true, because back then in the car factories, there were hundreds of workers assembling cars. And then a few years later, or maybe a few decades later, in the same factories, you had hundreds of robots and maybe three guys checking occasionally what the robots are doing. However, in those countries where you have lots of robots like that, you have low unemployment rates. Because in those same countries, all kinds of new jobs were created that nobody anticipated. 40 years ago, nobody would have predicted all these young people making money as YouTube video bloggers. <laughs> where they are interacting with other humans in new ways. And most of these new jobs are luxury jobs. But I would say that almost all of our jobs are luxury, luxury jobs anyway, because most of them are not really uh, important for the survival of the species. There are just a few important jobs like farming, you know, getting something to eat, and um, building houses such that it doesn't rain when you sleep at night, and, and warming up the houses or cooling them down. And all that can be done by less than 10% of the population. And then there are lots of luxury jobs, like journalists. Yeah, it's important, and they often make more money than those who are, buying the, who are making the houses. But um, it's, it's not essential for the survival of the species. And what humans are really good at is inventing new luxury jobs all the time, which are about interacting with other humans in novel ways. They are not focused on other robots or something. No, they are focused on humans. And I think it's going to continue like that. And humans won't have a problem with realizing that maybe there are smarter beings out there and they do their own thing because they are going to keep doing the human thing, inventing all kinds of luxury jobs that aren't really necessary, but fun. <laughs> Hola, Jürgen. Un placer compartir este rato contigo. Mi nombre es David. Eh, algunas personas tienen el miedo de que la inteligencia artificial adquiera conciencia de sí misma y perdamos el control de la misma. ¿Tienes algún mensaje tranquilizador para ellas? ¿O por el contrario, tenemos algo que temer? I don't have exactly a reassuring message uh, for the people, but I don't think there's uh, much reason to worry about that. A couple of years ago, I gave an interview. Um, and there I said, um, we have had little simple conscious machines for decades, since 1991. So the title of this interview was then, Jürgen Schmidhuber um, claims that conscious machines have existed since 1991, something like that. And let me explain you how that works, how to build a conscious machine, a conscious self-aware machine, which we already have. It's really simple. 
First of all, you have this one neural network, you know, just receiving inputs, videos and whatever, and producing actions, and it's interacting with the world, so it changes the world, and through these changes, the video that comes in changes, so it learns to predict the changes. That's how it builds a model of the world, a, a world model, as I called it in 1990. I called it a world model. And this world model is a second neural network, which just learns to predict the consequences of the actions of the first network. Now, the first network wants to maximize its reward. So there are these special inputs, which are the reward inputs. For example, uh, three times a day you have to eat something, otherwise you will get hungry, and this will be negative reward coming from your hunger cells, and you want to avoid those. You want to maximize reward, you want to, um, you want to minimize pain, uh, and you want to maximize reward. So there are these special input signals that um, have a lot of meaning because you want to either maximize them or minimize them. And of course, whenever we build a robot or an artificial agent, we give these agents pain sensors and reward sensors. Because in the beginning they are so stupid and they do all kinds of experiments and then they have to learn what's good for them and what's not good for them. Because if they bump against an obstacle, they could get damaged. So that's why we give them pain sensors. We don't tell them exactly how to avoid getting pain. No, they have to figure out that by themselves through a learning algorithm. So we just say, here is the objective maximize until the end of your life, maximize the sum of all the pleasure signals and minimize the sum of all the pain signals. So it's very easy to formulate that in a, in a, in, in, in a computer program. And then the consequences of that simple program are um, possibly uh, enormous because now the agent is trying all kinds of things and over time it learns which things it should avoid and which things are good for it. And then over time it learns to, to, whenever the battery is low and negative hunger signals are coming from the battery, it learns to go to the charging station and sit down there and, and get recharged, pleasure signals, positive numbers, just positive numbers coming in, uh, without uh, running into obstacles on the way to the charging station uh, where it would get pain if it bumped against the obstacles. But it learns to avoid the obstacles because it learns to use the video that is coming in uh, to translate the video into actions that go around the obstacles. So you have that. And uh, now you have a simple sort of emotions. Huh? They want to avoid pain and they want to uh, maximize pleasure. Now they have the second network which is just predicting the consequences of their actions. And now the second network is like a simulation of the world, more or less, you know. It learns to predict what's going to happen if I do that and that. And then the first network can use the second network for planning ahead, for planning the future. How does that work? Well, it can use the second uh, simulation of the world, um, which is an imperfect simulation of the world. Uh, it can use it to try out in mental experiments a few action sequences. If I do that, oh, then I will bump against the obstacle and I will not reach the charging station. So that's not a good action sequence. And then it tries another action sequence. Oh, if I execute that action sequence, I will move around the obstacle, I will reach the charging station, and all will be good. So it's going to select the other, um, the second action sequence. So it's using the model of the world for planning. Now, what happens in the model of the world? Everything that frequently shows up in the environment gets internal neurons that are represented. That's just the nature of these learning mechanisms for these neural networks. So in an environment where there are lots of glasses, you will have internal neurons and they stand for typical glasses. And in an environment where there are lots of faces, you will get internal uh, neurons. They, they react to a certain appearances of faces and a new face comes along and all you need to do is encode only the deviations from the prototype face that is in there. And so all of that helps the, the system to compress uh, the experiences in, in, in a few neurons. Now, the important thing now is to realize that there is one thing in the life of the agent that is always there when the agent is active, which is the agent itself. So just as a, as a simple byproduct of these standard machine learning algorithms, you will get internal representations of the agent itself and of its actuators, its fingers, its, its arms, its legs, and whatever it has, its battery, the predictions of how the battery will get fuller on the charging station. And, um, you know, all these, these predictions, they are being part now of this world model, which includes 
a model of the agent itself. Now, the moment the controller is using this world model for planning and wakes up these internal representations that stand for the agent itself, it's thinking about itself. It's self-aware. So self-awareness in the context of goals that the little guy wants to achieve is the most natural thing. And we have, it, we have had that for decades. And we had certain other aspects of uh, consciousness also for, for decades. So I believe that everything that people think is um, connected to this weird concept of consciousness already is existing in our current, actually our old uh, machine learning models, our old AIs that um, interact with the world, build a model of the world, use it for planning, and in the, in the planner, in the one model, there's a representation of the agent itself and it's being wake, uh, it wakes up all the time. Hola, Jürgen, soy Elena. Muchas personas, muchos expertos, eh, están diciendo que dentro de muy poco la inteligencia artificial va a superar a la humana en muchísimos aspectos, no solo en algunos. ¿no? Mi pregunta es, eh, ¿cuándo crees que esto puede suceder? Y sobre todo, ¿qué consecuencias podría tener para nosotros? It has already happened in many, many uh, fields. Mm -hmm. In 1997, for example, for the first time, the best chess player on the planet wasn't human any longer. And back then they needed a big computer, but today a trivial little um, laptop can play better chess than any human on this planet. So it's, in chess we have had superhuman performance for a long time. If we go even further back, um, multiplying two numbers, you know, even a little calculator can do that. And it's also superhuman performance because no human can multiply numbers as quickly as these calculators. And now we have more and more uh, things like that. Now, now we are beginning to see really important applications in healthcare, for example, where, where these uh, artificial doctors can detect diseases, certain types of diseases, better than the human experts. Um, 2011, my team with my uh, brilliant Romanian postdoc, uh, Dan Girejan, uh, for the first time had superhuman performance in, in a field which is important for self-driving cars, which is traffic sign recognition. So uh, the first time that a pattern recognition contest was, a contest was won by a deep learning system, um, which, which in the beginning knew nothing, but from lots of examples learned how to recognize these traffic signs. Yeah, that was 2011, so almost uh, 15 years ago. Back then, compute was um, almost 1,000 times more expensive than today, which means today we can do almost a thousand times more for the same price. So now we are far beyond superhuman in many, many applications. The big question is, when will we have an AI that is not only superhuman in this particular game, like chess, and in this particular um, uh, pattern recognition application, but when will we have something that is superhuman in basically everything? But, you know, I, I wouldn't worry about that. That can still take uh, months, if not years. Hola, Jürgen. Mi nombre es Esther y estoy un poco preocupada porque a veces la inteligencia artificial se usa con fines maliciosos. Y me preguntaba cómo podríamos prevenir estas situaciones y cuáles son los principales desafíos éticos a los que nos enfrentamos. That's also a very important question. And I think the answer is we cannot prevent that because there is no us, the humans. There are only eight billion different opinions about what is good for them. And some of these people are fighting each other. And as we speak, we have a war, uh, Russia attacking Ukraine and other wars. And both of these parties are using drones equipped with artificial intelligence to improve their own chances and to kill the enemies and to use pattern recognition to detect camouflage, tanks, and stuff like that, which maybe a human observer wouldn't immediately see. And they are using AI in thousands of new ways every single day, and you cannot stop it, because to them it's about life and death. So it's true. Um, there's a lot of AI weapons research. However, 
none of the AI weapons that are currently um, visible on the horizon are remotely as destructive as uh, the things we should really be worried about. Uh, I'm still much more worried about 60-year-old technology in terms of um, hydrogen bombs mounted on rockets, which can destroy a huge city within a few milliseconds, a city with 10 million inhabitants. Yes, today we have these drones and they, they try to pick out one single face in a crowd. And this is worrisome in many, many ways. But what's much more worrisome is that some people have access to nuclear bombs that within two hours can wipe out most of civilization as we know it without any AI. I see no way of stopping it, however, because all the big powers are going to say, if we don't do it, then the others are going to do it and will have an advantage. So you can't really stop that arms race. On the other hand, 5% of um, AI research are about improving weapons, but 95% of all AI research are, are really about um, making human lives easier. Because the major companies that are doing a lot of AI research, AI applications at least, maybe not so much fundamental research, but applications of AI, these companies, they want to sell you something. And you are going to buy only stuff where you think it's good for you. So they are trying to compete with each other, each of them trying to create a product which is hopefully better for you, such that you are going to buy it. So that's why there's a tremendous bias in humankind towards good AI. It's just a simple commercial bias, because they want to sell you something. Hola, Jürgen, ¿cómo estás? Soy Marta. Eh, tú has sido una figura clave en el campo del aprendizaje profundo. Si tuvieras que apostar por la siguiente gran revolución en inteligencia artificial, ¿en qué área crees que se va a producir? I think it's going to be connected to something that is dear to my heart, which is uh, this thing I call meta-learning. So if you look at today's learning algorithms, they are human-designed. So some human thought about um, how to create a method for making some of these weights on these connections between the neurons stronger and others weaker. And some of these methods are better than other methods, you know, so there's a comp competition between all these scientists. But, you know, um, once, once there's a good method like that, then it's used by many people and, and you are stuck with it. It's not, it's, it's not improving itself. And um, almost 40 years ago, not quite, um, in 1987, I, I published this um, diploma thesis, my first publication ever, which was uh, about trying to overcome this uh, through a learning system that not only learns something here and learns something there, and that's it, but it also learns to look, inspect, and it, it's it, to, to inspect its own learning algorithm and to modify it and improve it such that it becomes a better learning algorithm such that it isn't stuck always with this original human design way of improving itself. No, it also finds a way of improving the way of improving itself. And then also recursively finds a, a way of improving the way it improves the way it improves itself, and so on, without any limits except for the limits of computability and physics. So that was um, meta-learning, and back then, I told you before, nobody was interested in that. But today, it's a really hot topic, and many people are working on that. And, and we have um, very nice examples also in very recent years where, you know, a neural network learns to implement one of these popular learning algorithms. One of them is called backpropagation. It doesn't matter if you have never have heard the name. It's a famous way of um, making some of these weights strong and others weaker. And then the network itself learns to implement this learning algorithm, but in a way such that you can improve this thing which is now running on the network itself, such that it can learn to create a better learning algorithm. And you can imagine, to the extent that you are not stuck with these human-designed learning algorithms, you can get better and better systems 
that keep self-improving, that keep improving themselves without any limits. And I guess um, that will be the future. Yeah. Gracias, Jürgen. Es un placer escucharte. Mi nombre es Sofía y quiero preguntarte más sobre comportamientos. Si la inteligencia artificial aprende de nosotros los humanos, aprende también sobre nuestros sesgos, sobre nuestros juicios. ¿Puedes compartirnos un ejemplo? Yes, AI absolutely learns from the data that biased people give to it. And there are lots of criticisms um, leveled against AI just for that. For example, uh, there are skin cancer detection AIs, which learn to distinguish harmless spots on the skin from cancer, uh, from melan melanoma, I think it's called. And first systems of that kind, they were trained only on um, skins of people with um, fair skin. And then they completely failed when it came to people with dark skin. So that's a famous example how you have a biased AI because it learns only what it sees, you know, it learns from the training data and it doesn't generalize to the things that it has not seen, never seen or never seen enough of that. Now the answer, of course, is you have to remove the bias and you have to give these AIs training data from all human races and all skin colors and everything. And that's what's happening, of course. Well, the doctors are not stupid and they learn to uh, reduce the, the bias. Um, also the bias that you get, for example, if you have um, data only from male persons and maybe not enough data from female persons or vice versa. So, of course, you have to correct this bias. But in principle, it's easy to correct it. You just have to collect more data from the, the underrepresented groups and then this type of bias goes away. Generally speaking, all of us are biased towards the things we have seen as kids. And somebody who was raised in Spain, he has really different ideas about how the world works than, say, um, an Eskimo. Because the environment as a kid is totally different. And the Eskimos, they learn to distinguish hundreds of different kinds of snow. So they see little patterns in the snow which tell them what kind of snow is that. And if you are raised in the desert, you, you maybe have never seen snow before. So even the humans are super biased towards the training data they receive. It's just the same with AIs. Hola, Jürgen. Me llamo Sergio. Dentro de 20 o 30 años, ¿te ves confiando en la inteligencia artificial en un robot para tus cuidados? Well, I certainly do, because I know that um, these artificial doctors often are much better, better at picking out certain um, patterns that uh, are suspicious and that should be studied further. At the moment, we always have a human in the loop because what's happening currently are in, in medical applications, these programs that make suggestions to the doctors and say, look, I found this and I found this and I found this. And maybe the doctor then says, oh, I would have found this and this, but not this. And it's good that you show me that and I will have an additional exam just for this, for this here. But um, what we currently have is this combination of AIs and humans, because of course in um, healthcare, there's a, a huge regulation effort and they, they won't simply allow AIs to take over. No, first this has to be tested and only if it's, you know, 10 times better than a human, then it's going to become mandatory. So, at the moment, I'm trusting the combination of um, AIs and humans, which are probably better than humans alone. At some point in the future, I'm, uh, I guess, um, in many cases, there won't be a human in the loop any longer. Just like with airbags, AI of an airbag is really simple. It just has a sensor and if certain pressures exceed certain limits and it explodes and, and um, hopefully saves your life. And there was a time when there were no airbags and, um, and in a country like Spain, maybe you had, um, I guess, probably like 20 dead people per day. 
in car accidents. And then the airbags came and then the um, regulation offices, they had a look at it. At some point, the airbags were so good that um, they could reduce the uh, mortality rate to maybe only five people per day rather than 20. Now it's still the case that sometimes the airbag does the wrong thing. So the airbag explodes and maybe your car is going down the slope and you land in the river and you can't escape from the car because of the airbag and you drown. So sometimes in, in a small percentage of all cases, the airbag is already is actually doing the wrong thing. But all societies are using statistics in the evaluation of machines like airbags. And as soon as it was clear that um, you will have four times fewer dead people on the roads every single day, then Spain made it mandatory, and now it's mandatory. So societies as a whole, they use this, the statistical approach. Yeah, maybe sometimes this machine is not going to work, but on average it's going to work so well, it's going to save a lot of lives, so we do it. And the same is going to be true for AIs in healthcare and AIs in self-driving cars and in every application. Hola, Jürgen. Eh, muchas gracias por la sesión de hoy. Es muy inspiradora. Eh, te han llamado padre de la inteligencia artificial. Se te relaciona y te llaman precursor de muchas de las tecnologías que están cambiando nuestras vidas. Las tenemos en los bolsillos y en nuestras casas. Pero a ti, ¿cómo te gustaría ser recordado? How would I like to be remembered? By whom? Um, I hope my kids will remember me as a decent dad. And when it comes to AI, then also you have to think about remembered by whom? Because uh, maybe you, you recall that I mentioned that at some point in the not so distant future, almost all of intelligence is going to be outside of human brains. So almost all memory of the past is going to be outside of human brains in, in AIs and in AI scientists. And I bet these AI scientists, just like human scientists, they will be super interested in how they emerged from this weird thing that we call civilization, from this collection of biological individuals, that started the civilization project maybe 13,000 years ago. And 13,000 years is just like a flash in world history, you know, because world history is 13.8 billion years ago, is 13.8 billion years long. And at the very end, there's a super short thing, one millionth of world history, which is this flash of the civilization thing. And, and you know, if you zoom back, then you see the first guy who had agriculture uh, 13,000 years ago was almost, almost the same guy who had the first AIs uh, 13,000 years later. So, if you zoom back a little bit and then you imagine an AI civilization in the future, remembering their origins, they will say, yeah, there was this flash um, when biology became AI, because bi biology suddenly created these superorganisms in form of cities and companies and all kinds of infrastructure and all kinds of tools and then the tools became smarter and then at some point the tools weren't tools any longer but they were true AIs with their own goals and everything and they expanded into space and now almost all of intelligence is AIs and so they will be super interested in how they emerged from this um, civilization thing but then I guess um, only the specialists, the AI historians, they will want to uh, understand all the little details, you know, how exactly, when exactly was this published and was this published and how did this speed up of hardware influence the whole development and who contributed to the speed up and how did all these different uh, developments come together in form of the uh, first AIs that really deserve the name. And so I guess I will just be a little tiny puzzle piece in this huge civilization thing, um, which uh, in retrospective, collectively, just will look like a flash in world history. Hola, Jürgen. 
De verdad, inspirador. Uh, tengo una pregunta. Si viajaras en el tiempo y hablaras con el Jürgen que empezó tu carrera profesional hace 40, 50 años y le explicaras lo, la situación actual de ya, ¿él estaría desapontado o sorprendido en positivo con lo que ha pasado? I think he would say, um, I can't believe it. It's exactly how I predicted it. <laughs> So back then, I um, set myself the goal to build within my lifetime this AI that learns to become smarter than myself um, before I retire. And um, we are not there yet, but I'm not retired yet. <laughs> so it's looking good. I think in the near future, we'll have the true AI such that I can be ready to retire. Yeah. So it's all good. It's all according it's all running according to plan. <laughs> <laughs>